The following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. Time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. down. It's time to hit the option block. With your hosts, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com, Mike Tusa from KnowYourOptionsInc.com, and John Grigas from Options Express. Welcome back to the Options Insider Radio Network and our second episode of the Option Block. We're now we're into the meat of the show proper, and we have a full stable of guests. It's the first time all of us have been on uh, in probably a couple of weeks together, so it's good to have the gang back together. And with that, we will dive right into the trading block. <laughs> The trading block. And welcome to the trading block. And for those of you new to the show, this is the segment where we break down some of the broad macro interesting activity we're seeing in the broad market right now. And there's, you know, the general market is kind of unchanged right now. The Dow closed up about 15, the S&P about two points or so. But that's, that's not really telling us the whole story. There's a lot of ripples and currents going on in other areas of the market. For example, the ags have just been on a tear lately. The corn, especially corn, I think December corn closed somewhere up around 8% today, primarily on the fact that the Department of Agriculture came out and said corn production was not going to come in where they expected. It's going to come in dramatically lower than a lot of analysts expected. So that set off a, a flurry of buying activity in corn, and the ags were just on the move a bit today. I know Mike and John, you guys are uh, two born and bred commodity ag guys. So uh, what are you guys thinking about this big rally in the commodities right now? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know when it's going to stop. It just keeps on going. It's uh I hate to say the term irrational exuberance, but goodness gracious, if you look at a chart of uh, a lot of the agricultural things, I mean, it, MOO, for example. MOO is an ETF that tracks uh, agri international agricultural business, and right now today it closed at 48.90, I have it at, and as of the middle of August, we were in the 42 level. I mean, that is a huge move just and the broad-based market, not only for the ags, but the, the businesses associated with ags. Now, the other thing that's pretty interesting about Moo is that it has some volatility to it, too, and that if you're looking to sell covered calls against it or uh, sell some puts to get into the stock or the ETF, I should say, uh, there's a lot of opportunities there. So uh, there's a lot going on with not only the, agri with the ags, but also the, um, the businesses associated with them. Yeah, I have to agree with Mike. There, I mean, there's an underlying bid in, in the grain complex right now. We had that um, Russian export halt a few months back. Uh, you know, they gave it a spike, and then it, it saw a corrective pullback. Um, I think we're going to see some type of same thing here. I think the, the trend is still upward. I think there might be a chance to sell some puts uh, pretty safely. I just want to see uh, it pull back here from these uh, this, these recent spikes uh, to get some good premium. I don't want to sell too early and, uh, you know, be, be called away because I was too aggressive. Yeah, you know, Mike mentioned the uh, moo, which, by the way, I just love that ticker. That's that's fantastic. But uh, oh, it's an awesome one. But uh, I know moo moo is moving around a bit today. I know also the S and P Ag Index is also at a high level. I think actually it's at its highest level since October of two thousand and eight. So that should tell us all something, because unless you were unless you were in a coma for the past few years, you know that those were not exactly uh, easy times for the market, and to be pushing back up to those levels is certainly uh, certainly causing some anxiety out there. Well, you know, I've been talking to uh, one of my clients is actually an ag trader, and he was saying that the ags have been limit up the last two days. 
So, and we may be, and we're probably going to be limit up tomorrow. So, uh, until the market actually stops being limit up, uh, I have trouble imagining that uh, these won't keep going unless they, you know, at some point maybe they'll price in the uh, the amount that will go limit up. But this is a great proxy for these ad guys to actually go out and, and hedge some whatever positions they may have on. So um, I don't know where, where this stuff ends. It, it, it ends when we stop just being up, 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 up every day in the, the actual futures market. So let's not forget what really drives these things. I was going to say, Mark, but you, you do have a good point there. With the, some of these farmers will start to sell because of these high prices to lock in profit, which may be the start of, of a small correction uh, which I was mentioning earlier, but that is a good point. They, some of these farmers will see these high prices, and they will come in there and sell their, uh, you know, their actual hedge or sell their product. Yeah. You know, I think Mark brought up something interesting that maybe we can talk a little bit more in the uh, in the spread slash express block. A lot of our people coming into the options market and retail guys, especially who start dipping their toes into the uh, commodity and ag markets, they're not used to this whole limit up phenomenon and uh, and coming into a market and having it opening up limit and you're pretty much that's it. You're pretty much done for days and upon days in a row. So it's kind of a new phenomenon for a lot of these new ag options and futures traders. And we're getting a lot of questions. From from that on the site. I'm sure you guys over at, at Options Express are as well. And I don't want to jump all over the spread block. We can get into that in a few minutes, but it's just something we see a lot of and new people dive into these markets. They're like, oh my God, you know, I'm not used to this. I'm an equity guy. What is this? <laughs> what is this lock limit, lock limit up, lock limit down stuff? It really, uh, it really sends them into a, a tailspin. A panic. Exactly. Well, it, it, it's, it's the classic. And this is, I see this all the time. People trading things they don't understand. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I, here's what I ask people. I say, hey, knowing what you know about what you just did, if somebody said, hey, this is what I know and this is what I'm going to do, would you give them your money? Almost all the time, they say, no, no way I would do that. And then they go and do it themselves. I, I don't understand it. I don't get it. And it drives me absolutely batty. I mean, um, they should call me the count. I was getting so I was going batty. You know? <laughs> I think you just I think you just described the entire VIX phenomenon there as well. Everyone diving into things that they're not maybe maybe not really prepared for yet. Yeah, it, ag agreed. Couldn't agree more. Just a couple other things we can touch on in the uh, trading block before we dive into the odd block. Some quick comments. I know this week was a big uh, a big news for week for options people as well because. Now we have two more exchanges on the horizon. We have a definite date for C2, which has been rumored and been in the ether for a couple of years now. And they finally just pinned it down to within the next couple of weeks, they're going to be launching that exchange. And I was just at a dinner for the ISC on Wednesday, and now they announced on Thursday that they're going to dive into that market as well. So we have two more options exchanges, bringing the total, I believe, to 10. So talk about fragmentation. Do you guys have any, any, any viewpoints on this stuff going forward? These, these new exchanges that are coming up, all they're trying to do is take advantage of payment for order flow systems. Um, they're not adding liquidity to the market. They're not adding efficiency. Um, in fact, if anything, they're taking away efficiency from the market. I think they are, a, you know, it's one thing to have a, an organized, busy, competitive market. It's another thing to have a free-for-all. And more and more and more, the markets are heading for a free-for-all. And things like these flash trades, the maker taker model, um, the uh, you know this this whole racket of payment for order flow is nothing but bad for the retail customer and good for the exchanges and bad for the smaller liquidity providers and good for the big houses. It's just moving money around, and um, you know you've got to be very careful with the broker you select because. Um, it will cost you execution. You know, for every person that complains about commission, I tell them stop complaining about commission and start worrying about execution. There are all these cheap, cheap discount brokers that you can get. Oh, you know, you can trade 9,000 contracts for four bucks and then get filled 50 cents worse than you were going to get filled with a great platform like an Options Express. And obviously that is massive hyperbole, just to let you know. But um, 
I'm, I'm going to hold you to that 50 cent number now. So uh, if they don't get 50 yeah, cents. Trade there. Yeah. <laughs> not that Ash has expressed a great platform, but or is, is not a great platform, but the hyperbole of, you know, you do 50 cents worse, they charge you $3 for 9,000 contracts. That was the hyperbole. But, <laughs> you know, these cheap, cheap houses, they just slam you on execution because they're getting paid for, you know, they're, they are selling your, your, um, Order flow. They're selling your order flow faster than a two bit whore on <laughs> a, a two bit whore walking on the uh, the Atlanta Atlantic City Boardwalk. Okay, so if you if you think it's a good deal, it probably isn't. All right, nothing gets me angrier. So I couldn't tell from that that you were a little a little worked up there. Uh, was that was that me going off on some sort of tangent? No. <laughs> It's a wonder why this show is uh, seven hours long every time. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, I don't want to devolve too much into because we cover a lot of this on Options Insider Radio as well. And I, you know, I don't want to bring too much into this. This is more of a trading-focused show. But there is a lot of interesting aspects and ramifications of this for your casual options trader as well as your institutional and your high-end guy. And, you know, I've had the same kind of complaint and same discussions about some of the newer entrants into the options space lately that they are really not bringing much to the table. They're kind of cannibalizing what other people have already brought in. So has, ironically, so has the CEO of the ISC. He said that, you know, they aren't really very additive. So I asked him that exact question on Wednesday. I was like, well, if you guys are going to be jumping into this fray, what are you guys going to be doing that isn't, you know, another Me Too cannibalizing maker-taker exchange? And he frankly said they don't know yet. I mean, and that's why when the journal running with this story that they've announced a new exchange, uh, yeah, they, they've talked about doing it, but I, there's nothing really concrete yet. And I don't think they've even worked out what they're going to bring to the table that is substantially different than what everyone else is out there doing, just gaming, you know, a few pennies here or there. And, and, and the problem with this whole maker-taker system, which is what all these new ones are based on, is that it gives the liquidity providers a great excuse not to send your order to the Bex Exchange. Um, you know, they're, the whole concept, the way most people think about best representation is, oh, my order will get taken to the exchange that, you know, I'm trying to buy something in uh, Agilent Technologies. I'm trying to buy, buy some calls and the market's, you know, 10 cents wide. And, you know, I carp, I, and there's two exchanges that are offered at a buck 90 and all the other exchanges are offered a buck 95. And I'm going to bid a dollar eighty-five, which is the mid market. Now, when most people think of best representation, they think, well, certainly my order will get sent to one of those exchanges that has the best offer and the most liquidity. The fact of the matter is, is that best representation doesn't really say that, and there are many of the uh, inexpensive brokers that really, really, really take advantage of that. Um, you know, there's there's a reason why the, or, the order router that's set to best means where they get paid the best is like what I like to say. So you couldn't have said it. You couldn't have said it more perfect. I mean, that's exactly. They, people say, oh, we have a, a routing system that ensures best execution. Well, a lot of times it's the best payment for order flow for the firm. Um, I've seen that at the bigger houses like E Trade and Ameritrade. But um, yes. you know, here we're, we're here we still do an NBBO quote guarantee. We have a proprietary OX smart router. Um, you know, two things we take very serious at Options Express, and that's customer service and best execution. And that's kind of what's made us so uh, so perform so well and so successful. You know, and I, I said this on one one show in the past, anecdotally, talking to a very, very, very big trader um, that does uh, the uh, the oh, the auto auto trade. He was saying Options Express beats everybody hands down every time. Oh, and the so, execute service? Yeah. Interesting. Which is just, just a thought out there. So, the, Yeah, you know, it's funny that in 2010, we're still bickering and talking about best execution or order routing and smart execution. I mean, these are the same conversations we were having like 1999 and 2000, debating who was getting more payment and who was routing things through trade throughs and everything else like that. And to think, you know, 10 years later with penny wide virtual pick -em markets, we're, we're still banding this stuff around. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of embarrassing to say the truth and shows that the, that the SEC really did drop the ball 10 years ago and they should have stepped in on, on payment for order flow back when they had a chance. But 
enough of my uh, pontificating on this. I think we'll, uh, with that, we'll wrap up the old trading block and we'll dive right into the odd block. The odd the block. block. The odd block. <laughs> And welcome to The Odd Block, and this is the segment of the show where we discuss some interesting and or unusual options activity that we're seeing going up on the tape today. And we're going to start it out with uh, an interesting little one, Pulte Group. I'm assuming I'm pronouncing that right, right? Pulte Group. That's P-H-M. And it closed at $8.21 today, so about pretty much unchanged. And they are a residential home builder. And they saw some interesting, uh, interesting bullish activity today. With essentially one big trader coming in and just knocking out a bunch of those uh, of those Nove eight dollar puts for thirty five cents, he started off with about twenty thousand of these things going off for uh, for thirty five cents for a uh, a grand total, a grand credit to him of about seven hundred thousand dollars. So not an insignificant trade by any means. And as we've discussed before, this is a relatively illiquid name. So this trader is obviously not expecting to get out of this trade anytime soon. So he's probably very comfortable with owning the stock down down at 765 at this level. Interestingly and enough, when he put the order in, it was all or none. Yeah, how many, so, how many times do you see a 20,000 lot all or none going up? That's what he had. He said, no printing until the entire, you can't print until the order is filled. And there was good edge in the trade, and there were a lot of different guys that wanted to do it. It took them a little while to get everything together. Um, but I, you know what? I have to, full disclosure, um, I, as you guys know, I write for thestreet.com, and I actually suggested piggybacking on this trade today uh, because of I really like, um, I really like what this guy did. Uh, the, uh, he's basically... Buy if if for some reason this drops below seven eight bucks, he's buying the he's buying Pulte at the absolute fifty two week low below that. All right, I believe the total the low close that I've seen uh, was I'm looking seven seventy seven. We might have had not had an absolute low of seven seventy, but we we never closed below actually seven eighty. And so this guy would actually not only be buying Pulte below its 52-week low, he'd be buying below its 52-week trading low. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. I'm looking at it now. It never closed below eight. I might have traded below there, but it never closed. It says 52-week yeah. low here is eight on eight even. So yeah, it hasn't even gone below there from a close. Yeah, and, and you know if you do the math on this, the return of this thing, this guy sells a you know with the stock trading 815 with 38 days to expiration. He collects thirty-five cents. What does that come out to on an annualized basis? You know. Yeah, that'll be something if we start seeing these. Uh, if he's rolling these twenty thousand lots every month. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, think about it. Three, you know, I'm I'm just looking, doing the math here, and on like a really over like, even if he just sold twenty thousand thirty-eight days out and collected thirty-five cents, by the end of the year he'd have like three dollars and thirty-five cents in his pocket. Uh, what kind of return is that on an eight dollar stock? You know, it's like forty two percent. I have to imagine if he got that predictable that the market makers would start leaning on him pretty hard after a while. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's not gonna but he's those not gonna those returns stock. would drop substantially after about month three or month four, I would think. Yeah, I know, but I still think he could get thirty in between thirty and forty out of it. Um Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe. Yeah, what they would do obviously they they can't there's this a point which they they can't do a certain amount. They've gotta, you know, you, you, you bring things too low, somebody comes in and scoops you and just screws you. Um, and then you miss your chance to sell to this guy, right? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing worse than over-crushing volatility, having someone come in and completely buy it up, and then they end up getting to sell it to the other guy. <laughs> this is an interesting way, to definitely interesting trade, as you pointed out, and an interesting way to put on a position at, at a relatively decent level. Uh, and it's also an interesting execution, like I said, all or none. That's uh, that was I, the part I was really surprised. I, I, John, you're a broker; you've seen more than I have, probably. But uh, how many twenty thousand all or none lots do you see coming into uh, to Options Express on a given day? Uh, zero, zero. Now we we recommend that people use the all or none feature, uh, you know, for thirty to fifty contracts or more, or five thousand shares or more. But I mean, that all or none feature uh, sometimes will put you at a disadvantage. You know, you're not displayed on the MBBO quote. 
Um, execution is a little bit slower because it's a manual order, but uh, they, yeah, they we don't recommend it. They can trade through you. They can trade through you. Yeah, you're not displayed. And you have to have, uh, you know, in this case, a, a bid larger or equal to the size that you're trying to offer. In this case, I don't know how they got that order filled, but, uh, you know, Brokers good, good for them. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know what? It, it, the, the thing is, is doing it all or none, it really stops these guys from leaning on them, believe it or not. Um, it's actually easier to lean on an order that isn't all or none. Uh, because, you know, if the thing goes away from you, you can just go and grab some of it. If it's all or none, then it, the whole thing has to trade. So I actually think it for, a, for an illiquid name like this, in order to stop himself from getting completely run over, I actually think he, he kind of did the right thing because this way the market makers couldn't go in and just sell everything in his face because they don't know if this whole thing's going to trade. That's true. You couldn't put up some other trade and then pick off a hundred lot for yourself to hedge it exactly. because you don't you don't you don't know that trade is done at the end of the day. Exactly. The, uh, so yeah, definitely a couple of interesting things about this trade, not just the size, but also the the manner of execution. And now moving on over to Chevron or CVX. This one closed around eighty three seventy one, down about twenty one cents. And this one we saw an interesting ratio put spread going up in January. So we saw a trader coming out and picking up 3,500 of the Jan, Jan 2011 80 puts. So uh, those, those went up for $2.77. And then he sold twice as many. It was a one by two. Uh, 7,000 of the Jan 72 half puts for a dollar twenty, and that works out to a uh, to a net premium of thirty seven cents a contract. And so uh, we're seeing some interesting interesting stuff on this trade. And he's got a, obviously he's got a break even price of about uh, seventy nine sixty three. So he thinks it's going to trend uh, a wee bit lower before expiration in January. But you know we don't see too many size ratios going up these days. So it's interesting to put these out a little bit there and just show them out there to our audience and show some of the different ways you can execute. Your, your straight up spreads as opposed to just doing one by one, you know, re legging in on a ratio also works as well. I like this train. I mean, I don't know if I necessarily like full disclosure. We, I, I have clients in Chevron more along the lines of collars and protective puts, but I like the concept of this trade, the one by two ratio put spread as a way of uh, kind of like doing a complicated way of uh, selling a put to get into a stock, so to speak. And that. <clears throat> This trader looks like he believe he could believe that uh, perhaps Chevron's going to go down a little bit, but if it does go down to the 72 level or maybe even a little bit lower, he's more than happy to own it at that level and make some money on the way down from the 80 puts. So yeah. uh, th this is a strategy that we use uh, somewhat frequently to get into stocks in lieu of just selling a put to get into stocks. Yeah, it's an interesting ratio. It's an interesting way to position yourself. And like I said, this guy's got to start dropping about 5%, about 4.8% before this trade really starts to break even in his favor. And it starts gapping down to around, you know, where his 72 half strike is. Then he really starts doing well. Moving on from uh, Chevron, because not much to say about the ratio put spread. It's just interesting, interesting little... Oh, go ahead, Mark. You have something you want to say about that? Or? No, no, I was just saying, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's, it's an interesting little spread. Um you know, I wouldn't look too much into it. This isn't Chevron does a little more paper than Pulte Homes, so I wouldn't. Re <laughs> the key is on something like this, you have to take the size of the trade in context of how big, how liquid the options are, and there's a big difference between you know like ten thousand in Chevron and ten thousand in Pulte Homes. So, yeah, it's but but you're right. This is a really interesting trade. It's always fun to kind of look at these type of trades. So. And speaking of interesting trades, we have one big interesting size trade of the day goes definitely to uh, to Xerox today. This one lit up our tape pretty early, and Xerox XRX. And I didn't uh, look up where it closed today, but uh, eleven oh four, I see. So we had uh, a size size strangle going up in, in Xerox today. Uh, so a trader came in and sold forty thousand of the April nine puts for forty two cents. And then he turned around and sold on the upside 40,000 more of the April 12 calls for 71 cents. So he netted himself 
a dollar thirteen forty thousand times for a grand Jeez. total a grand total of four million five hundred and twenty thousand dollars in premium he collected. Obviously, this guy thinks Xerox is going nowhere by April, and he's putting his money where his mouth is. He uh, he took off a size piece of Xerox today. Did he dump stock in this thing too? Now I was looking. I, I didn't see I didn't see any hedges going up on that. I, I did. I didn't. Um, I didn't see any major hedges either. So yeah, looks looks like he just naked came out and hit the strangle. He's looking for uh, Xerox to hover till April. You know, it it might be an interesting way for a long to hedge a position if you think about it. Um, if I was a big big holder in Xerox, and I I don't mind buying it below nine, and I want to collect a big premium, it, you know, it's an interesting way of lot of 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 hedging if you were long. Uh, but we really don't know what what this guy's story is. Um, you just, yeah, I can't. I'm not seeing any huge prints on this thing. Um, yeah, you know, this is there's nothing else to indicate anything that this guy was coming in as you know a size underlying holder. Of course, that has to be one of your guesses whenever you see something like this going up, just because it's it is unusual for someone to come in and just blast out this many strangles without some other axe to grind somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. No, the only the only hedging I'm seeing is from the other end. It looks like I'm seeing some market makers selling stock, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, he he didn't he did do a couple of clips of this thing. It wasn't done in one trade. You know, this so. might, this might be a flip side to kind of what we were talking about before with the Pulte Homes guys coming in and knocking out twenty thousand at a time, and then maybe potentially rolling that trade every month. This guy obviously just decided to jump out to April and not even bother. I mean, obviously, forty thousand is a lot to do in every single month. But if he, you know, if he if he wanted to maximize, just go for pure decay, he would want to hit it on you know on a much nearer term than April. Right. He apparently just decided to put on his one bet, get it off, and, and let it sit till it decays. And he decided April for some reason was the best way to do that. I haven't looked at the term structure. Is April? significantly higher than some of the other months out there you know every and the further out you go the more your the more the term structures is kind of screwed up so um you know yeah i mean april is going to be significantly higher let's see um you know if you wanted to sell you no know, you know november is trading at an IV of about 36 at the money and april a little higher 37 38 uh, but nothing, nothing ridiculous. Um, obviously, I'm guessing the April was a little higher prior to this guy selling. <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I would think so. Yeah, <laughs> uh, forty thousand well, strangles yeah. tends to do that. My guess is he got in at like a thirty-eight or a thirty-nine fall at the money. Um, it's now down to about a thirty-seven. So he took it in a couple points, but that's still higher than where he where he could sell November right now in Jan. So it looks like he probably picked up one or two points there. Nothing ridiculous, but certainly not uh, nothing to sneeze at. And then uh, we'll finish up with just a, a quick one we saw going up on the tape as we were putting some stuff together, and this is a New York Times NYT. These guys closed up $8.62, up $0.61, cents. and it uh, looks like they did about 60 times their average daily volume today, and really they usually do about a couple hundred maybe or maybe a few thousand contracts at most and they put up a size number of trades. The bulk of those seem to be in the April 7 puts. At least 21,000 of those going up for prices ra- being bought and prices ranging from 65 to 75 cents. So once again, April, the go-to month for some reason out there in New York Times, a lot of, a lot of bearish sentiments for uh, New York Times that were heading below the 7 strike by April. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. Oh, sorry. You got to be a, you got to be a short seller of uh, print media these days, especially newspapers. Um, you know, they're they're headed toward uh, their own death, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had this discussion with someone the other day, and I, I think the last holdout for print media is, is that 20 minutes of a flight when you first take off and when you land, when you have no choice but you have to read print media or sit in silence. That will keep them afloat for another couple of years, but beyond that. Yeah, there's not uh, the future is looking grim for for all sorts of print media. But I don't know what aside from the general uh, negativity towards print as a whole. I'm not seeing any particular news that that drove this buying activity today. You guys seen anything? Well, I know a couple of I know a couple of weeks ago, or a couple of days ago they had some news out that they're, you know, even their kind of revenue had, you know, they've been able to raise price and raise price and raise price to keep delivery revenue and deliveries kind of constant. Um, and even that's starting to fall off. 
Um, and, you know, what else does this company have that is uh, of any type of real media value? Um, I mean, I'm trying to look through what they own. Um, you know, they own a ton of print. Do they, I'm not seeing a lot of television. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot. I mean, I'm, yeah, they own about.com and a few other things, but caloriecount.com. I mean, I don't think caloriecount.com is going to carry <laughs> New York Times' business. And, you know, they're not diversified. And they were, and, you know, the one thing I'll give the Wall Street Journal credit on is they never went the free route with the uh, internet. And that has saved them from uh, really kind of a lot of the problems that, you know, we see in the Times Company and the Tribune Company as well. So, uh, you know, it just things look kind of bleak. The Journal is kind of a unique beast, though. They're one of the few print publications that could probably command that, uh -huh. that institutional access to the website. You know, a lot of these companies, New York Times included, were thinking earlier this year that iPad was going to be the, the great salvation for print media. And they were going to have these fantastic apps. And they were going to charge again for these apps. And it was going to be a whole new revenue stream for them. And we're starting to see uh, some pushback on that, not that not really coming out to where they think. I know the New Yorker is a good example. They just launched a new app for the iPad, and they want to charge subscribers twice. So you buy the print edition, they, you don't even get the uh, the digital one. You have to pay for that again. Uh, oh, so they're, they're getting a lot of pushback on that. And New York Times has uh, has experimented with different online models as well to uh, to not such great success. So it looks like the big tablet revolution, which was the last gasp, if there was one for print, is going the way of the dodo. And of course, that still doesn't solve that problem we discussed earlier with the the first and last 20 minutes of the flight, because you can't fire up your, your old iPad during those, those sacred 20 minutes. So with the, uh, the imminent death of print on our lips, we will close out the odd block, and we will dive right into the express slash spread block. The Spread Block, brought to you by Options Express. Options Express lets you trade futures and now foreign futures too, where and when you want. From advanced charting and free daily trading ideas to automated systems trading and free educational resources, Options Express is the online broker for all traders. Visit OptionsExpress.com to open your free account. Futures involve substantial risk and are not appropriate for all investors. Please read this disclosure statement for futures and options available at optionsexpress.com slash futures risk or by calling 1-888-280-8020 prior to applying for an account. Options Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. John, and now we are in the good old express slash spread block. What have we been seeing? What have we been hearing from retail? Well, I mean, we touched on it uh, earlier today in, in our segment, uh, the option block, but it's grains. It's grains, grains, grains. I mean, uh, when I left the work on Friday, uh, we, people were getting, you know, calling in about grains, uh, live chat. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, we do have a live chat feature. If you don't want to pick up the phone, uh, we do customer service through live chat as well. But, um, you know, everybody remembers. It's, it's probably one of my favorite movies, if not, you know, my favorite trading movies, if not my favorite movie of all time. Turn but, those machines back on. Yeah, trading places. I mean, what was the center of of that whole plot was Beaks getting the USDA grain report estimates. Okay, so that's what came out Friday between between the morning session close and how grains trade is that at uh, nine thirty central uh, they reopen from. A pause that they have at about 7:15 a.m. Central. So between that time is when they release this USDA grain report. Um, uh, just to touch on what they said about the corn, uh, reported that the average yield per acre for this use for this year's U.S. corn crop will drop to 155.8 bushels of corn, as compared to last month's estimate of 162.5. Okay, that's a drop of almost 7,000 bushels. Um, you know, to have a drop of 1,000 would be significant. So. You know, without even having to call the floor for an opening call, you know, we just knew that the grain complex, the beans, uh, you know, you got your meal, oil, um, you know, wheat, even uh, oats and rough rice. I mean, everything was limit up. Um, and if you're not familiar with limit up, we're you know, going to a little more detail here. Unlike stock, uh, and not not all futures, but the majority of them do have uh, limit up and limit down 
price movements. Uh, corn, 30 cents. Oats, uh, 20. Beans, 70 cents. Wheat, 60 cents. And what that is is that once we hit that level from the previous previous day is close, these things can no longer trade any higher. So we opened up, lock limit up, about an hour went by, called the floor, trying to get some numbers and find out, hey, is this thing going to see any follow through on Sunday night? Um, in corn, they had 144,000 contracts bid limit up. So that means, you know, I had some guys, hey, I want to I want to buy it at this price. I think it's going to go higher. We'll, we'll get in line. You're, you're 144,000 and one. Um, you know, significant buyers came in, significant short covering occurred. Um, and, and, and an interesting thing also that happened is a lot of people say, well, I have a stop in it. I'm, I'm protected. I can, I can get out at the market. Well, it doesn't work that way. Okay. You have a stop order. It blows through there and you have, now, oh, I have a market order. Well, you can't buy it when it's, when it's lock limit up, you, even if you have a market order. Um, another thing about stops that we had a lot of people calling in, uh, we had to educate them on was the fact that there's something called a protection point. And what a protection point is, is how far a market order can run. So like if a stop is elected at $7.50, where you say, well, I, I can get filled. Well, they have a five cent protection point, meaning that if it can't fill from $7.50 to $7.55, your stop order um, becomes a limit order at $7.55. Okay, if it's a GTC order and, and it runs and the market runs away, you're still working that limit order at $7.55. So there's, you know, a chance that even when you're using a stop order, um, as you should. I mean, when you get into a trade, you should know your exit and entry points prior to putting the trade on. A stop order in this type of volatile market doesn't actually guarantee that you will get out of your position. Um, but it was a, a pretty volatile day. Uh, you know, Sunday they opened up, lock limit up. They did pull back a little bit. I know Mark uh, Sebastian said that they believe that they were lock limit up today, but I believe they did pull back. Um, did you guys see if uh, they finished lock limit up at 115 today or? Uh, let me take a look. I thought they did. They might have. Uh, yeah, I don't want to contradict you because I thought you said lock limit up two days in a row, but I thought they, I thought they pulled back, especially for the soybeans. The and soybeans for, finished one fifteen oh four, one fifteen or uh, the November soybean tri uh, last sale was uh, eleven fifty and eleven fifty four, eleven fifty oh four. So and, this, and the reason and another thing, too, is that when, when we have this type of lock limit up, the exchange will make a decision on whether they want to uh, expand the limits. Usually I think they do two to three days lock limit up. They'll expand the limits. They've kind of backed away from that. Um, we did have expanded limits for the Sunday opening. Corn went from 30 to 45. Uh, beans went from 70 cents to $1.05. And wheat uh, went from 60 cents to 90. Those are the three main ones that you're going to see the, the volume in. But, you know, with this type of volatility, they have to make more room for the markets to continue to move because uh, otherwise you're going to have three, four days of lock limit up. Um, interestingly enough, our analyst, I think uh, Rob, he might have been on here on the last show or the first show, I should say, um, he does write uh, Futures uh, Expresso, which is a uh, newsletter that we send out daily each morning before the grain markets open up. Um, you know, if you're have an account at Options Express, you can sign up for this newsletter. They send it to you every morning, but it's a good read. It also gives you a trade ideas for whether you're bullish or bearish. So if you say, hey, I'm looking at this chart, and this is a, a temporary move up, I'm going to go ahead and put maybe a, a you know, bear call or bear put spread on um, and take advantage of a pullback. Um, so did they expand lock limit up today? Is that why we weren't there? Yeah, no, they, they decided uh, before the open um, that they were going to move limits. Um, so before the Sunday open at... Yeah. Uh, Six o'clock central. Yeah, they expanded all the so limits by about 50%. I was talking about Friday, so he must have not known they were going to do He must have uh, assumed they weren't going to do that for uh, for the new open. So that could have probably what been, been what's driven, what drove. Uh, th that could be why we, we may actually, actually managed to stay up. I don't know. We were up. Uh, is, uh, yeah, we were up 15 and 4. What is that? Fifteen and four? What? I'm not. I'm not a it, 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 it trades in. Uh, it trades at fractions of a cent, so quarters yeah. of a cent. Um, yeah. That's what a lot of people misunderstand and say, "Hey, it's, I want to buy it at uh, you know five dollars or something like that." But it actually, yeah, it trades in quarters of a cent. So that point zero two or point two five is actually a quarter of a cent. No, oh, gotcha. Um, Gotcha. But if they hadn't, yeah, they hadn't expanded those limits. There's a good chance uh, your your buddy would have been right that we would have finished yeah. uh, and locked limit up. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, we have earnings coming out. Uh, Alcoa kicked it off on uh, Friday uh, with better than expected earnings. Uh, we're hoping that's kind of the, continues the, uh, the, the the tone for the rest of the earnings season. 
so you guys must obviously your uh, your switchboard has been lighting up with grain questions. And you mentioned something I thought was interesting. You also have the uh, the live chat option. I'm kind of just curious what uh, what percentage would you say of, of your customers are coming in and contacting you via the live chat versus picking up the phone and and launching a, a frantic phone call saying why are why are these limit up? It still remains, uh, you know, a minority of the amount of uh, customer contact that we do see. I'd say it's in the area of about 25%. Uh, you know, obviously people are more likely to pick up the phone and just speak to a live broker. But I got to tell you, there's some instances where I don't want to be on the phone or I'm doing something else and want to walk around my house and in the live chat, uh, you know, it just makes sense. Uh, you, you have licensed brokers on the other side of that, uh, of that I am. Um, you know, they can shoot links to you. They can show you screenshots. So they can pretty much do everything you know, what we can on the phone is just at a, at a slightly slower pace. Yeah, they do a great job with that. I actually know of a rep that he's not with uh, Options Express or Brokers Express, but there's actually been a time when this rep would, if he, if he had a question that he needed answered, like on what are the contribution limits for an IRA or something a little bit more complex than that, it would take him less time to just use the Options Express live chat than going to his own people and his own broker dealer and waiting for the bureaucracy of getting an answer. So they have a great reputation. They do an excellent job with that. You know, people sometimes come to our site and they uh, complain about commissions or whatever it might be. But, you know, there are there are inherent costs to running a brokerage. And one of them is having a staff of trained brokers on the other side of that IM window waiting for you to, uh, to send an IM. That's, that's always an interesting resource that they have. It's amazing to me still, after having done this for so long and been involved with so many different firms, just just how much the resources available to your average retail guy has just exploded, just even in the past couple of years. It's unbelievable. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, besides I am, I mean, we have, uh, you know, there's still people that send in emails. We do a few thousand, uh, you know, I don't know, they have the numbers right in front of me, but I think it's around 15,000 emails a month, uh, which seems high, but I mean, we think you have 400,000 accounts. It's actually uh, not that much, but they, I mean, we, we always get an answer out to you within uh, 24 hours, most of the time, same day, but we're, we're aiming for four hours. That's our goal right, right now is to get a turnaround. Um, you know, those people really don't expect that type of answer that quickly. But, uh, you know, like I said earlier, we try to put customer service first. Well, yeah, you know, I feel like a lot of a lot of firms treat their treat their customers like, uh, I don't know, like a pot dealer at a fish concert. You know, it's like, all right, take your bag of weed and get out of here. And they, are we speaking from experience here, Mark? Or, or what? I, believe it or not, I'm not a big fan of fish. Um, oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> that clears it all up right there. There we go. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. You know what it is? Is I had a bunch of buddies that were uh, that were huge fish fans, and they were unemployed for a, a for a good four or five years after college while I was not. So, l- life lesson: if your kid if your kid listens to fish, expect them to live at your house after he graduates college. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and with that little bit of life wisdom, with our no, that's staying in. That's gold. That's gold, baby. I, I want your I want your wisdom percolating out there to the masses on on a regular basis. And with with that pearl of wisdom, we shall close out the old express block and move straight into the strategy block. The strategy block. And welcome to the strategy block. This is the segment of the show where we discuss some uh, particularly relevant or interesting strategy or technique to implement in the options market. And I believe today, Mr. Tusa, you plan to discuss 10 year note futures and options. Am I correct, sir? You are correct. Now, I have to say, I was all excited about what I was going to kind of subtitle this, but after the whole fish concert uh, analogy, I don't know how I can top that, but I'm going to try. So <laughs> here, here we go. Jump on the boat with a 10-year note. What do you guys think of that? I like it. I like it. Not bad. But, Not know, bad. Then you, can, you, could, you could go, here, fishy, 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 fishy. Uh, no. No, I, I don't know about that one. I'm definitely leaving that in, though. That is that is that is gold as well. Oh, so <laughs> you, you, you just keep digging. I love it. It's fantastic. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna put it all we're gonna put it all in there. There you go. But anyway, on the ten-year note, 
This is, in the retail world, not a lot of retail clients trade this, and this is a pretty interesting product. Ten-year note, it's, it's kind of like the S&P 500 in the fixed income world. Uh, for a stock trader, people want to know what the S&P closed at today or what the Dow closed at today. In the bond world, there's the 10-year note. That's kind of like the benchmark, so to speak, as to how things perform, what are interest rates, and that type of thing. Now, what I want to talk about today is just it's another way with which you could look to trade something uh, as a retail trader. Let's say that you are bullish on bonds, or bearish on bonds for that matter, but for sake of simplicity, let's just say that we're bullish in terms of explaining the product. If you're bullish on bonds, you can, one, go out and buy some bonds, two, you can go out and buy some type of a bond ETF, whether it's IEF, SHY, uh, TLT, just depending on whether you're, what uh, time frame you're looking to do. But then there's another option that you have, and that is going long futures contracts. Now, there's futures contracts on the two-year, the 10-year, the 30-year. Today, I just want to talk about the 10-year. With that, the size of the contract is approximately $120,000. So by getting long the 10-year note, you're really taking a pretty sizable position from the standpoint of how big you're actually playing the market space. So with that in mind, it's a pretty leveraged product as well. The initial margin required to get into a 10-year note futures contract is about $1,900. So you only have to, have to put up about $1,900 for the ability to control over $120,000 worth of an investment. Now, if that leverage is like... Mike, oh, and, and the, the, day, the day trade on that is less than $600. So if you were just going to go intraday... I mean, you're talking $540 uh, to hold $120,000 uh, notional value. Uh, yeah, that's insanity. Because like yeah. typically in the day trading margin, it's usually what, about half of the maintenance margin, if I'm not mistaken? Correct, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's something else. So if you want leverage, you got it here in the 10-year note. Now, with that being said, full disclosure, I don't have any clients in the 10-year note futures right now, but I have traded options on them in the past with my own account. And... What I like about it is it's, it's one to where you can kind of get some of the, you can get premium in it, so to speak, and you don't have a ginormous margin requirement, so to speak. So if you're uh, selling options on it, whether you're selling naked options or whether you're doing ratio spreads or whether you're just trading the underlying, it's something to where you can get quite a big bang for your buck. Uh, another way with which you can use 10-year note futures, let's say that you have a large portfolio full of bonds, uh, corporates, muties, uh, uh, government treasuries, and it's at least six figures big, and you're concerned with rising interest rates. Well, you could use a, a futures contract on the 10-year note as somewhat of a hedge against interest rates, not against the bonds themselves, because if you have California municipal bonds and they do and they default, well, the interest rate hedge isn't going to do you much good. But let's say that you're concerned with rising interest rates. Interest rates have an inverse relationship to the valuation of bonds. One thing that you could do is short either the two-year, the 10-year, the 30-year, depending on how your portfolio of bonds matches up. So that way you could collect your interest rate payment from the bonds themselves. But if you're concerned with rising interest rates and that's going to hurt the value of your bond portfolio, you have a short on in a bond futures contract. That's one way with which you can hedge it. Now, the other thing with the 10-year note, plan on getting confused with the tick sizes and the... <laughs> And the uh, fractions of it. Yeah, that's something we get all the time oh, is yeah, just totally. uh, ticks. Let's dig into that a little bit because that's just a nightmare for most people coming into these for the first time. It is. And the, the way to do it, I think, is just to get, get, just get an understanding of how it works. The 10-year note itself, the futures contract, that trades in 30 seconds. So, and it trades in halves as well. So you can, because right now I'm just looking at an older quote on the 10-year note. Uh, it's, it's at 127 and 11 and a half, 30 seconds. So it actually has 0.5, 30 seconds could be a quote on the 10 year note. So it's one to where you kind of got to get a feel for that as to how that works as well. Uh, the other thing with it, if you're looking at an option that just trades in 60 fourths. So the options on them trade in 60 fourths, the futures themselves trade in 30 seconds. So you get a feel for that. You can learn a little bit more about that on the Options Express website. You can under the under the 
quote tab, you can click on futures chains. And when you click on the futures chains, one thing you can do in the symbol box, just type in TY. And that'll give you a chain of all of the futures contracts on the 10-year note, uh, the December, the March, the June. And then you can click on TYZ10, which is the December 10-year note contract, and that'll take you to the quote detail page. Now, in there, you'll actually get to see the tick sizes, the times that it trades, uh, the size of the contract itself, all the information that you need for the 10-year note it's available within the quote detail page on the Options Express website or the Brokers Express website for that matter. So I definitely recommend checking it out for all of you OX clients out there. And for those of you that aren't OX clients, well, you guys just don't get to trade. You'll miss out on all the fun. No, <laughs> so, I got to tell you, I, I, I love the 10-year note. I don't know if it's the $472 day trading margin, but uh, you know, I traded that exclusively for two years. And I, I, I think there's a, it's just a great product to, uh, to trade. If anyone's seen the chart lately, it's only gone up. I mean, that's just, that's just what it's doing with the fed, you know, kind of, but coming in there and buying assets, um, you know, it, it's, it's really doesn't have a, a look like it's going to pull back here anytime soon. You seeing a lot of interest in the treasuries over there at, uh, at options express these days, John, or I mean, yeah, well, you know, futures in general, options on futures is, is, is another market like uh, equity options that just have exploded. Uh, I think it was in um, May of oh, May of 10 yeah, this year, we did over a billion contracts the first time uh, in the month of May. So it was a very significant milestone, and it's only gone up from there. I mean, you know, gold, 1354 is closed at, you know, treasury yields at, uh, you know, all-time lows. Um, you know, the currency markets with the euro trading down from to 115 all the way back to where we're at right now, about 138. I mean, these commodity markets, I mean, look at the Dow, up 15 today. When the equity market can start moving, people move right over and they see, seek and find opportunity in these commodity markets. But like I said, I'm a big fan of the 10-year uh, note. It is physically delivered, so it's not something you want to hold on to through uh, first notice day or last trading day. But um, um, it, is a, it is a great product, and, and the calls and the... the uh, the questions from the uh, public has picked up in the futures and commodities uh, markets. Yeah. All right. And with another uh, another pearl of wisdom, we'll move right into Around the Block. Around the Block. All right, and welcome to Around the Block, and this is the segment where we look at some of the numbers and events that are on the horizon for the market. And this week, you know, we've talked a lot about economic numbers over the past few weeks. This week, we're heading back into uh, into earnings, and so we got some inter interesting earnings releases on the horizon. We've got uh, Intel on Tuesday, and always a big chip bellwether, a big technology bellwether. We've got J.P. Morgan on Wednesday, a financial bellwether. They got Google on Thursday, you know, the mother uh, mother of tech stocks these days. And then GE on Friday, which GE is just a bellwether for just about everything. So if you're into watching earnings, there's a lot for you to to feast your eyes on for the next couple of days. Anything else you guys are, are interested in particularly over the next couple of days? You know, I still just can't get over the way they just came in and just destroyed volatility today. And I think that bodes, I mean, that, that, that hits hard. I mean, we're dealing with like I said, adjusted for weekend decay, we were down almost two and a half points on the VIX. This was just an unbelievable, just clobbering of implied volatility. Now, granted, realized volatility on by a lot of um, levels is way below where we're still trading. But, um, you know, this just seems like it was a little overdone into you know, earnings season and a lot of other different things. Now, I would note that um, while SPX Vol got absolutely crushed and NDX Vol got crushed, strangely, the OEX and um, the Russell got beaten, but not quite as bad as the other two. The OEX Vol didn't get beaten as bad, and neither did um, Russell Vol. So it's a little strange. I feel like um, this could have been some sort of uh you know i'm not you know i'm not sure is that a financial play is everything good with the financials uh you know are interest rates going to stay that low for that long that they're all just going to be able to clean up um is it because of the commodities um or is it just nobody expects anything to happen 
You know, it is surprising. Well, it is surprising in the face of multiple limit up markets in corn that we that the VIX would close below nineteen today. I mean, that if that's not the definition of surprise and uncertainty coming in on on the ag side. I mean, the I mean, a VIX in the teens right now. It just it seems a little complacent. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, VIX futures are even off. I mean, are just, uh, you know, the the October VIX future right now uh, closed out. One second here. As many, you know, the October VIX future closed out uh, still above 21, believe it or not. And the November VIX future closed out. Oh, my. November, get this. Check out this contango. Um the October VIX future closed out around 21.25. Where do you think November, the November uh, future closed? Above 25. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I won't even tell you where December is. December was, uh, December is right around 27. So just under 27. So they apparently nothing is happening in October. Something might happen in November, and a lot of fear in December. I guess no one's uh, no one's selling the election just yet. The, uh, Not quite. But like I said, I still overall, I still just think even at these levels, uh, it's just it's just so such a level of complacency compared to what we're seeing. Like I said, we have no idea what's going to happen in November, and uh, we have uh, we have no idea what's going on in the ag markets right now. We're still just coming off lock limit up for a couple of days, and there's so many other. Levels of uncertainty that are just swirling right now. We have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow with earnings, you know. And uh, there's so many numbers on the horizon that could bump this back up. That to be to be hovering at or near the uh, the teen levels and overall volatility is just uh, it's it's surprising. I didn't mean to quell all discussion there. Anything else you guys are looking at there, Mike or John? Uh, well, we got uh, a whole bevy of economic numbers uh, besides earnings coming out this week as well. We got. Uh, Fed minutes, which used to be a big, uh, big deal until they became so transparent that everyone knows what's uh, going to be coming out. Uh, CPI, PPI on uh, Wednesday and Thursday, um, and I think we're finishing it up with uh, Michigan sentiment and retail sales uh, on the fifteenth. So it's it's nice to see this number. I mean, this amount of numbers coming out in one week. Uh, you know, I hate to see it when you have two or three numbers in the whole given week. Hopefully, you know, some of these numbers can kick vol back up. Uh, you know, near November 25 level or something because yeah, I mean, you said we closed on the VIX cash around below 19 today. Uh, 1896. Uh, 18, 18, 18, yeah. Yeah. I was I was laughing when it fell below 20 today. I was like, oh, that's that's just exceed, you know exceedingly yeah. low. Well, but hopefully, the VIX cash is it's the VIX cash is not forward looking. I I really this will be a, this could be a great debate, but I don't think the VIX cash is forward looking at all. I th- I think it it's it's uh. It's more of a reactionary number than it is a an, an actual, you know, I have to, I'm, I'm constantly, um, you know, trying to correct people on when on what the at the money strike is for the VIX options, you know? But haven't you heard VIX is a great pure hedge for the market and it's a fantastic prognosticating tool for where the market will be a month from now. It's, it's, it's perfect on all of those horizons. I, I can't believe you would disparage it so. I, I apologize. I apologize. I am one of those VIX haters, I have to admit. So, And there goes our enormous CBOE sponsorship for uh, for next episode. <laughs> no, no, I like the VIX features <laughs> and I like the VIX product. The VIX cash, that's the one I don't like. I think the VIX futures and the VIX options actually have a real value in hedging when implied volatility skew is overly inflated. So... And that's going to do it for another episode of the Option Block. I want to thank all the hosts. I'm glad we can get everyone together in one virtual room today, and hopefully we'll be able to do it again later this week. Thanks to all of you for listening and for downloading the show, whether it's on iTunes or on the Options Insider or all the other various and sundry places that this show is popping up. OX customers, you guys are going to be able to... uh, to download and stream it directly from the website pretty soon and hopefully from the portable app as well. That's still in beta, so to speak. So thanks again for listening to The Option Block, and we will see you next time. Become a part of The Option Block. Just visit www.theoptionsinsider.com forum to post a question for the hosts. 
You can also submit questions to twitter.com slash option block or leave a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Make it interesting and your question just might make it on the air. The Options Block is property of the Options Insider Incorporated, all rights reserved.